Hello, and thank you for joining us, Friendship Christian Church, Friendship Ministries YouTube channel. Today we'll be in Mark chapter 11, verses 1 and 10, and we're talking about the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Is it a triumphal entry, or is it a tragedy? At the end of our message, we will go into a time of communion, during which time the emblems of the bread and the cup will be served. You're welcome to stay after the message and take part in that. Don't worry about what you have to eat or drink. God will take care of the elements. Before we get in our message, let us have a word of prayer. Fathers, you search our hearts and our minds. We just pray that you meet all those needs that are listed there. And Father, we pray for our prayer list, that you give peace, comfort, and healing to everyone we have listed. And Father, we pray for those who are still trying to get out of Afghanistan, those that are under bombardment and shelling and shooting in Ukraine, those that are first responders, those that are health care workers, those in the mission field, and those serving this nation, that you put a hedge of protection around them all, keep them free from harm, from evil and disease. And Father, please be with Friendship Christian Church. Please allow it to shine with the light of the truth of Jesus Christ in Frankfort, Kentucky. Father, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. Triumphal entry or tragedy. For centuries, the church has taken this Sunday, known as Palm Sunday, at the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem as a special Sunday. It's the Sunday before Easter, and it's been set aside for this special commemoration. Now, I want to draw your notice to the setting of where we are. Take a look at verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples. Now, we're, we're on our walk with Jesus. We're on our walk to Jerusalem. And we, on this route, we approach Bethany and Bethage. And beside an ancient church in Bethany, Bethany is still there. And this church is there. And inside this ancient, beside this ancient church in Bethany is a door. And that door leads down to an old tomb that is believed to be the tomb of Lazarus, where Jesus had raised him after four days. From there, we can walk to Bethage. And there's an ancient stone that commemorates Jesus mounting the donkey. That's where he had gotten on this foal of a donkey. Then crossing the top of Mount Olivet, we pass the tombs of several prophets. We descend into the Kidron Valley and then ascend into the old city of Jerusalem, where step by step we can walk the Via Della Rosa, the way to the cross that Jesus walked that day on Good Friday. So everything is still there. If you ever get the opportunity to go see it, that would be awesome. I, I wish I could go see it sometime. So that's the setting. That's, that's where he's at. Then in verse 2, saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there. So he's in Bethany. He's telling them this, and Bethphage is where they're going to find this colt, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asked you, why are you doing this? Tell him, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. So why is it an animal that's never been ridden? In the Old Testament, the Jews were told to sacrifice a red heifer that had never been used for plowing. It was a, for a sacred purpose. So this foal, this colt of a donkey, must never have been ridden. 
Jesus is setting it aside for this special purpose of entering into Jerusalem. And of course, after he's done with it, it'll be taken back. Uh, the donkey is very important uh, during this time. Uh, it is what a pickup truck is for us today. It's used for multiple purposes. And uh, it's been uh, used for this sacred purpose, and it's cargo. It's cargo is going to be Jesus himself, God in the flesh. This cult is going to transport God in the flesh. Uh, kind of makes me wonder, uh, spiritually, if the cult knew who its rider was. Verse 4, They went and found the cult outside, in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to. And the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the field. Now, this is to signify that a dignitary is coming to town. Now, what they were looking for was a Messiah. A Messiah that was outlined in the book of Isaiah. A Messiah that's going to restore everything in this world into its rightful place. And what the people were thinking the rightful place of Israel was, was to be a free nation. And with its borders expanded as it was during the times of David and Solomon. And that they would be sovereign. And that with the rule that they were under by the Romans would be cast away. The Romans would be done away with. So they're misinterpreting Isaiah. That's, that Messiah is going to come who set things right. But he's not going to come to the book of Revelation. And they were thinking he was coming now. So they were throwing their cloaks on this. They spread their cloaks and palm branches. That's why we call it Palm Sunday. Those that didn't have cloaks or didn't put down cloaks would put down palm fronds. That's rolling out the red carpet rolling out the red carpet. Uh, so those who went ahead in verse 9, and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. So they thought the kingdom was going to be restored. Israel's borders will be what they were at the time of David and Solomon. There would be peace in Israel. There would be nobody oppressing them and nobody that can attack them. So when they said, blessed, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, that's what they were looking for. The Messiah, as they believed him to be, out of the book of Isaiah. The problem is they're pulling the trigger too early. That Messiah is not coming till the book of Revelation. So they, uh, they have a mixture here in these verses, verses 9 and 10, of two Jewish traditions. Two Jewish traditions. The first is the Feast of the Tabernacles that's taking place. When Israel came into the promised land after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, God was concerned that they would forget their journey, their 40-year journey, that they would forget the hardships that they faced. They would forget the trials and tribulations that they went through and how God got them through all of it, through everything. So he didn't want them to forget that. So he set up a special feast day called the Feast of the Tabernacles. Sometimes it's called the Feast of Booths. All it is is a 
They were to remember being in tents in the desert. So they would go out and pitch tents for a week and then eat and have a feast and then a festival. The whole nation went camping, as it were. Afterward, they would take the branches and march in procession to the temple singing Psalm 118. Hosanna is an expression of praise. It's a prayer to God. So they would take these palm branches then at the end of this feast and march to the temple singing Psalm 118. So that's part of what's going on. The other is the Feast of Hanukkah. And this feast is very important at this time when they're talking about blessed, the coming kingdom of our father David. They're pointing directly to the Feast of Hanukkah. As Jesus rode into the city, the people remembered another person. His name was Judas Maccabeus, who rode into the city as well. And they were breaking foreign oppression and liberating them. Judas Maccabeus led an army of Israelites and overthrew their oppressors. And then he rode into Jerusalem as the great victor. So they were thinking, perhaps, that if Maccabeus could defeat the Syrians and come riding into Jerusalem, just think what Jesus is going to do to these Roman oppressors. He had just raised Lazarus from the dead. Think of the power he has to defeat Rome. So the crowds were, were really overcome by these images of victory. Powerful images that day. They didn't see Jesus. They saw another Judas Maccabeus. And then the shouts. Uh, the, the cries rose, oh God, Hosanna, they say, Hosanna. It means, Lord, save us. Lord, save us. It's a recognition of their need and understanding that God must do what only he can do. Judas Maccabeus overthrew the Syrians by the power of God. Jesus, the current Judas Maccabeus in their thinking, is going to overthrow the Romans by the power of God. And then there's a prayer uh, of, of desperation. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's, it's a prayer of sorts. It's, it's Passover time. It's Passover time. And hundreds and thousands of Jews from around the world have come to Jerusalem to take part in the Passover feast, commemorating the exodus out of Egypt when the angel of death would pass over each house that had the sign of the cross in blood on their doorposts. And arriving at the temple, they would greet each other saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This was the official greeting at the temple. And it has messianic implications. So the Jews are now shouting this to Jesus. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You're going to come back to the temple. God is going to be here. We're going to be a great nation once again. The Messiah. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest, they shout. The prophets had foretold that the Messiah would reign on David's throne forever. So they thought Israel is going to be this mighty kingdom and is going to be secure from oppression forever. They're thinking nationally. The prophets, however, were giving the prophecy God was showing them. It's being fulfilled by Jesus, but it's a spiritual forever. That's where they misinterpreted. 
So this Passover, unlike any previous Passover, there is hope now for these oppressed Jews that they're going to be free at last. Free. Free at last. And they hope that God will sit on David's throne forever. But tragedy, but tragedy is that they had the wrong Messiah in mind. He's not another Judas Maccabeus. They had it all wrong. They needed Revelation 19. <clears throat> Speaks of Jesus returning on a donkey. But instead of a donkey, it's going to be on a white horse, a triumphant king. You see, Isaiah and Revelation are together. Isaiah seeing Revelation happen. And these people, these people only see what they want to see. They totally misinterpreted Isaiah. And they're, they're thinking they're getting the Messiah that they want not the Messiah that they need. They need spiritual salvation. They have corrupted the entire religious system. That's not what they want. They want another Judas Maccabeus. So what kind of Jesus are they shouting for? They're, they're pushing a social agenda, a political agenda a national agenda, and they're heaping it all up on Jesus. And Jesus doesn't have any of those agendas. He has a spiritual agenda. He wants to save the world from the sins of the world. He wants to save each and individual person from sin so that they will have eternal life in heaven. That is where the kingdom of God is. They did not understand. He spent three years trying to teach that. They did not understand. So they're getting a saving Jesus, just not a social, national agenda type Jesus. So he came in humility. He didn't come in a white horse. He came in a pickup truck of the day. Not a tank, a pickup truck. He came on a donkey. He came in humility. And every lost sinner, every lost sinner can be forgiven and find peace in this Jesus not in Judas Maccabeus. I hope that you have found peace. I hope you have found forgiveness. I hope that you have a room in heaven for all eternity. Because that's the only way. The only way to get there is through Jesus. So I hope you've you found the way. I hope you're on your way. But if you're still lost, if you're still chasing the wrong agenda. Come to Christ. Come to the cross. Come to Jesus. If you need help, if you have questions, call me, 502-220-1285. I'd be glad to talk to you about that. Let us uh, close this message uh, with a word of prayer, and then we'll go into the Lord's Supper. Father, we just pray that as we go forth into our week, that you will give us the will, the strength, and the faith to be a worthy servant in our community and with those that we interact with. Father, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for staying with us. We'll be going into the Lord's Supper. Uh, Jesus did after a week after his triumphal entry, he did go to the cross. And the significance of the cross is he gave of his body. His body took on sins, the sins of the world, my sins, your sins, everybody's sins. 
and he had to suffer in pain. The wages of sin is death. He had to suffer in pain as he was dying for those sins. And so that's what we mean by giving of his body. So get you something to eat. Don't worry about if you don't have unleavened bread. I, I have some bread here. It symbolizes that body. Uh, let us pray. Father, we pray that you take this element, that you transconfigure to be the substance it should be, the body of Jesus Christ, the body of the innocent given for the guilty. Father, we ask your blessings on this bread in Jesus' name. Amen. Then he did something else on the cross. He gave up his blood. The blood washed away the sins. The blood covers us as we go to God for our judgment. God will see Jesus' blood covering us. And that gives us free passage right into heaven for eternal life with Jesus. To be there with those that went before us and to await those who will come after. This is the eternal life that was talked about in the scriptures. Let us pray. Father, we pray that you take the contents of this cup, that you transconfigure it to be the substance it should be, the blood of Jesus Christ. As Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection, the blood allows us resurrection of eternal life in heaven. Father, we ask your blessings on this cup in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us, and may we all go in peace.